Boston, right? And, and the culture is rich, right? Um, but it's nice to be in New Orleans and to be here with y'all and to like, I just, I just keep saying y'all like that, every single black woman I see. You know, I came from a black woman, I am a black woman, I love a black woman. Um, so this is like my jam, you know? Um, this next poem is also about a black woman um, by the name of Margaret Garner. Folks are familiar with Margaret Garner. Um, and if not, she um, is kind of the character, who the character is based off in Beloved, and Toni Morrison's Beloved, right? Um, but Margaret Garner was a, a woman who was enslaved. Um, she had uh, four kids and a husband. Um, if you look at like some of the history notes, you'll see that her first child was very dark skinned and, you know, of her husband, but the rest of them, it looked like came from the master, right? Or she was raped by the master. Um, and so um, there is this the story or the reality um, is that she and her family ran away from slavery, right? And they crossed the Ohio River. Um, and as they were crossing it, they got caught, right? And while the husband began to like fight off the slave catchers, uh, Margaret Garner began to kill her children um, because she didn't want them back into slavery, right? And she only killed one, right, before they caught her, held a trial to see um, if she was going to go back to slavery or be killed, um, and eventually was sold further down south along the Mississippi River um, into this harsher punishment of slavery, right? So this poem is um, holding all of that difficult, heavy history. I'm going to ask that you guys move through it with me. Um, the poem is written in three parts, right? So um, it's written one side going down this way, another side going down this way, and then I'll read it across, yeah? So you're going to hear some of the same things. Um, the first side is called Margaret Garner Crosses the Ohio River. And it is in the voice of the Ohio River. Folk stay gunning toward me like I'm the second coming. Like every Medea ain't a god with purpose. Cross me like a crucifix and I will lay Ohio bare. There is no word for a mother who has lost just an unjust law riding sweetly, gliding a fetus into the property of somebody willing to break a woman into a hollow harvest, a sin of younger child. Wave through me like a hen, a prayer, a river of Jordan, a Mason Dixie gateway, I, the chariot, freezing up, pardoning myself in your quest. Second is called Margaret Garner Crosses the Ohio River, only to get caught and sold down the Mississippi in the voice of the Mississippi River. Like I'm some type of pistol, folks stay running from me, mercy me. I thin the bloodline, I devane the country with a kitchen shank, Mississippi. Seldom down river, there is no sympathy for a child gone to clean sugar, cotton stalk, crowning the bones, cane fields, tankering the mouths, split the family into quarters with a slip of sail, big money, old man river, steamboat, I may be a move of water, but can as easily be a tree. Poplar or dogwood, the soil of the South, the blood on my hands, a bomb. And this is the third way, and the cross. And it's called Margaret Garner Crosses the Ohio River, only to get caught and sold down the Mississippi, or the mother stands trial for murdering her children in the voice of Margaret Garner. Folks stay gunning toward me like I'm some type of pistol, like I'm the second coming. Folk stay running from me like every Medea ain't a god. Mercy me. I thin the bloodline with purpose. Cross me like a crucifix and I devane the country with a kitchen shake. I will lay Ohio 
there. There is no Mississippi Southern Down River. There is no word for a mother who has lost sympathy for a child gone to Queen Sugar. Just an unjust law rotting the sweet. Cotton stalk crowning the bones. Blighting a fetus into the property. Cane fields cankering the mouth of somebody willing to break Spring the family into quarters, a woman into a hollow harvest with a slip of sell big money. Ascend up yonder, child, wave. Old man with her steamboat blew me like a hen. I may be a womb of water, a prayer, a river of Jordan, but can as easily be a tree. A Mason Dixie gateway. I, poplar or dogwood, the chariot freezing up the soil of the South, hardening myself in your quest, the blood on my hands, a bomb. Okay, I know it's hard to put on the fort, so I appreciate those claps, though. So, um, yeah, but I'm just thinking about that in all of the ways when it, when it feels like um, we don't have power. I think somebody said that earlier, right? Like, being oppressive, you know, they make you feel like you don't have power, but the reality is we have it all. And I think about Margaret Garner and the choices she had and how she still, you know, chose to take things into her own hands and to claim her own power and whatever capacities that look like, right? Um, this last poem is also about a black woman. Um, people don't work in Dandridge. Yes, okay, I heard one little woo, I like that. Um, but Dorothy was a famous black actress, singer. She played Carmen Jones, right? People say she was before her time, but she was before the Civil Rights Movement, right? Which means she didn't get all of the opportunities afforded to her, right? Um, but there's this urban legend, I like to think of it as an urban legend, um, that says she went to sing in Vegas, right? And she was walking past the pool, and she said, oh my God, I can't wait to get into the water. And they said, we'll have to drain the pool if you get in it, if a black person gets in it, right? Um, and then there's a movie, right, at the Polyberry Placer, in which she actually does, in fact, dip her toe into the water. And later on, you can see that they drain the water, right? They drain the water from the pool, and that there are, in fact, black workers cleaning the pool, right? Um, this poem is an Afrofuturistic reimagination of that story, right? It's um, the space in which we get to write our own stories and reimagine the future, right? All, all, Adrian Marie Brown says all organizing is science fiction, right? Um, and I think about the fact that folks wrote a declaration of independence, right? They like went in a room and wrote this declaration and now we all are living in it. And what would it mean for us to write our own stories or write the, the world in which we wanted to live in? Um, this is called <coughs> Dorothy dips a toe into a pool after being warned the water would be drained should a black person swim in it, 1953, Las Vegas. And all at once, without and within, each well of wet everywhere swelled dry. The woman in the shower, shriveling, shaken, bare. The cook, steaming at the sinks, faulty faucet, the rust, keening and dragging itself through pipes. Chalices unpeel, air wilts the face, moisture abandons the flesh, the breath, the girth, water unflows. We runs away like blood from a wound. The swimming pool brimming moments ago now hold mothers who hold babies dry sobbing at its base. Guests at the last frontier lay leisurely. Their bodies broil the riddle on the deck. The black spell is the yes cascading over enough. The anti to the anti, all kept from me in spite, shall spite keep from you with force and in another land, unpromised, the color blue opens and spreads to blanket each eye. 
Dorothy stands at the water's ledge. Her curls and linen lie loose. Her skin cool and sweet sings a song unsaying but known Dorothy, a tall tie, coaxing herself into herself. Dorothy, a good curse, moves into waves, wave after wave. The dancing wet rushes to gather at her hips. She cups the clear in her palms and splashes upward. Dorothy raises her arms in ocean rain, urges the body to name itself religion. Dorothy splatters and ripples bring forth a sanctum. Each droplet is plenty for the city's south side. A, each droplet is plenty for the city's south side. A shower gives itself to the children on 83rd playing at the hydrant. A spray fills the pot of collards on a back burner. Another flows through a school's fountain, one slime with lead. Dorothy swishes water into the sugar breeze and it lingers in air. No one thirsts. Moisture soothes a lonely throat. Do demands a mother seeds to grow. Dorothy raises the ocean, and oh, I want to tell you how her hands quiver cool drops toward the sky. How the water can hardly stand to let her go. Thank you all so much. I hope you keep in mind that you can try to keep the water from you as yours all along. Thank you so much. Hey, 
from Goldman Sachs for all of you who are following the amazing work for one million black women and, and in that order. Round of applause now. Marshall, a round of applause. Oh, yeah. uh, 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 but Girl Girls Pray follows me also. You need to have to, to bring in the spirit and pray. That's my sister. Matter of fact, we don't need you to do inspiration. <laughs> uh, so thank you all. Thank you all, those who are watching online, and thank all of you all uh, in this room for uh, just being here. Uh, in the moment, yes, we're here, obviously, to, for Essence Festival, in person, live in person. And it's a party with a purpose, as Tom Jordan always says. And so this purpose is what we're here for today. I want to thank Oxfam for America. For Sheila, one part time. Yes, That's part time. Uh, who uh, also will come up to bring uh, co-host remarks. Oxfam reached out to us through our sister Joy on uh, Norwood. Um, and so uh, we lift Joy up again uh, as she's under the weather. And you know she's here. Uh, and all of the Oxfam family, can all of Oxfam wave your hand, those who are Oxfam folks in the room. And so we're here for a serious continuation from this morning. And this, uh, this focus is around. Uh, the power of black, our leadership as black women in this country at a time uh, that we need to use all the power and faith and organizing and empowerment and loving that I said in the black now on each other that we can, that we can win this battle against the attack on our rights, voting rights, our reproductive rights, LGBTQ plus rights, our freedoms, our privacy, and it will be for us to leave this nation uh, better for this, the generation that's here and those yet to come. So I thank you for that. Uh, I'll uh, say more in my closing remarks, uh, but I want to bring up at this time uh, my mentor, my friend, my leader, a brother who I don't know how he does it. Uh, I'm going to tell where you at this today. And you're saying that he goes all over this country, big town, small town. He can go in corporate rooms, he can go in the White House, he can do, he can be right there on the grassroots or levels in the community. Um, has never, ever, ever forgotten that his power is about helping people and empowering people. And I was one of those little girls who was in that he helped empower. Uh, and saw something in me I didn't see it myself when I was a student at Clark College in the a <laughs> few years ago. And, uh, uh, and got me involved with the NACP, got me involved with understanding my power much earlier than I think I would have had he not, God not brought in uh, our journeys together. And no matter what, uh, uh, if I call Tom George Jr., he will say yes most of the time. And he said yes to one year to serve as a chairman, I think it's been five or something like that. And we just, uh, uh, did a river cutting at Clark Atlanta University where the National Coalition uh, named the Thomas W. Dorsey Jr. Leadership, Civic Engagement, uh, Economic Empowerment, uh, and Social Justice Institute. Uh, after this brother, who had, uh, who uh, needs really no introduction for those, he also chaired, is chairman of the 100 Black Men of America. He's an entrepreneur. He got a whole lot of folks that work for him, but he still finds the time Support into community. So I bring on Thomas W. Dorsch Jr., our chairman, he be Thomas.
follow the marches in front of the attack. And we see it over and over again. I'm from Georgia. 54% of all the people in Georgia are women. 31% African American, 16% uh, Hispanic, Latino American, about 2% Asian American. We make up the majority of those white men in our state who are afraid of losing that power. They're afraid throughout this nation of losing that power. And so what they're busy doing is trying to ensure that they're going to stay in control over and over and over the decades, and we cannot allow that to happen. So it's up to us. You know, it's amazing. I have seven granddaughters out of my 14 grandchildren. I turned 72 in April of this year. I grew up during the time of segregation. I never, ever thought I'd see it again in this nation, where people are fighting in terms of keeping all of the citizens of this nation that have an access. And if we don't vote, and we keep saying over and over again, if we don't vote this year, if we lose one seat in the city, and people forget it. It's a challenge now because we got a couple of folks who are on that, on one party, I'm not supposed to be nonpartisan as the chair. I, I deal with reality. My mother and father told me, no, you the truth, and the truth will set you free. There are a couple of folks who aren't clear about which party they're in. And so while there's a split almost 50 50 in the Congress and the U.S. Senate, and I worked for the U.S. Senate for 16 years before I got a real job and started my first company. Uh, 1994, but the key thing for us to understand, our challenges are here. Again, it is the right of women to choose. Without women, this world ceases to exist. And you have to understand that people forget that women, unfortunately, too many women undervalue their value. Because when God, and I'm a proud and, and serious believer in faith, but when God created woman and man, Woman was taken from the side, as the Bible says, not from behind. And we're partners. But at the end of the day, if women weren't here, the world would cease. And we have to understand that. And women have to understand their power. I want all of my granddaughters to be able to live in this nation and succeed and do what it is, whatever it is they choose to, to, to do. The same for my grandson. But we have to leave it for the generations to follow a better place. And right now, like never before, I never thought I'd see a president attacking the democracy of this nation. I never thought I'd see folks turn their back on protecting this nation. And so we have to make sure that we vote and we get people who understand government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So we have to make sure not only in these rooms, but we partake in these bills, we got to make sure we're all in the street. And we're trying to make sure under the real men vote, under the 100 and our efforts with the divine nine and NAACP and others, we got to turn out, even though they tried to, to come with roadblocks after we proved uh, from the runoffs and from the elections almost two years ago, we proved that we can make a difference. And so while there are challenges, there are opportunities for us to do more. So I want to thank you for what you do, my sister and my my mentee and, and lady who's been for nothing. Give it up, Melanie. Melanie has sacrificed so much for our people. She could have taken a corporate job. She could be anywhere she wants. But she is a soldier for the battle of freedom and opportunities for this nation. Please, folks. I mean, I know people have gotten comfortable. I wear my mask for two reasons. One, I've been battling over the last two years stage four pancreatic cancer. I've got seven of the baddest doctors in the world. But it's something wrong when you have to have money to live and survive. It is something wrong when too many of our people die because they could have had treatment. They could have had access to medication. They could have had, again, a lives to carry them. I'm going to win this battle and I'll be two others. Uh, but, but the important part, as my good friend Dr. Miles Monroe said, and I want to share that with you. He said the most valuable real estate in the world are the graveyards where people went to their graves 
with so much talent, with so many resources, with so much experience, that they went to the grave instead of sharing. And he says we should die in. Every day I get up, I empty my life for others. So that my grandchildren and children will have people who will look out for them. Just as those ambassadors beyond the Dr. King and, and I can go on to another, to another plate and we got so many uh, uh, great, great warriors who have gone. Women and men who fought for us, they have the right. We can't sleep on these folks. They sacrificed so that we could have what we have today. They're trying to take it away. So, so with that, let's do more for where are you at? There are 110,000 new infections per day of COVID-19. It is not over. It is not over. I've been shot up, I've had both boosters, and if another one comes, I will take it. But I simply say to you, you don't have to die. And because of our preconditions, two-thirds of the people who died have been African Americans. Wear your mask. It only takes seconds to be infected. I want all of us to live abundant lives. Let's go vote, let's go organize, and of course, let's make sure as us men will, we know we can rule the world.
Um, so thank you so much for staying with us um, for the rest of the afternoon. Good afternoon. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. I know that we all agree when I say that Melanie is a national treasure. And it gives me great pleasure to be here with her and each of you. As Tommy said a few minutes ago, she is a soldier in the battle for the freedom of our country. I'm going to make my remarks short and transparent. I'm Asahi Pompei. I'm a lawyer. I've worked at Goldman Sachs for 17 years, and I've risen through the ranks there to be the most senior black person at the bank. Yes. I'm the daughter of Caribbean immigrants. I'm the daughter of Edith and the granddaughter of Blanche. Now, there are three things that I want to share with you. One, awareness. Last year, we launched an initiative called One Million Black Women. Yes. Simply put, and I know many of you are aware of the initiative, but I want to bring awareness to everyone. Simply put, it is the largest commitment ever in the history of this country, specifically focused on black women. Ten billion dollars of debt and equity investments, and on top of that, hundred million in philanthropic capital to impact the lives of at least a million black women and girls over the next 10 years. Yes. Second thing is how this initiative was birthed. This initiative was born of black women, by black women, for black women. Now, we did it through listening tours. We've done 55 listening tours because we know Goldman Sachs, 150 year old investment bank, needs help to figure out how to best serve black women. So this was a humble Goldman Sachs. This is a listening Goldman Sachs that says this must be, and I'm gonna say that again, must be co-created with black women. And so we've been conducting listening tours, and this is an invitation. We'll continue to do listening tours. Join us. We need you. As to how to deploy that $10 billion in terms of investment and philanthropic capital. By black women, for black women, with black women. 
We know that black women are foundational to our families and to our communities, but even more so to this country. The last thing is, we also know that none of this would be possible without our voting rights and without a fair and democratic system to operate in. So we are privileged to have the mighty Melanie with us on the advisory council of a million black women. So together, out of the huts of history's shame, we rise. Up from the past that's rooted in pain, we rise. Join one million black women. I thank you very much. And another round of applause for the black woman. Because how many of you know if it was not for a black woman in that seat, with that power, with that access, with that PL, with that budget, with that voice to advocate for black women, we would not have what we get. Let me just repeat this again, and the necessity of black women um, to fan out in positions of leadership, but particularly in corporate America, uh, one of the largest institutions um, to leverage those resources to support us. So again, another round of applause for Asahi Pompei. We thank God for you, my sister. We thank God for your mother, your grandmother. I felt the energy. Um, we are grateful for that. We're going to bring up the state panel, but while I'm doing that, again, uh, you know, I really, um, and I think Coca-Cola, Travis is still here, I am super passionate about not just the work that we do, but also standing in the gap for corporate leaders who look like us, because I know they go to the table for us, and it's often not easy. And so keep them in your thoughts and in your prayers that while we vote people into office to advocate for us, um, we also should hold space for those who are also in corporate positions to make sure that the resources continue to support um, folks who look like us. Does that make sense? Say yes or yes. yes. All right, uh, yes and yes. And so now, without further ado, I am going to bring um, up the uh, state panel, and I want to welcome you all to this discussion. To this discussion, a very timely discussion, a continuation of what we uh, talked about and some of what you heard um, this morning. So I want to welcome you to the Black Women uh, Leaders Power Table Talk Number One. And um, I'm going to have them introduce themselves and really just connect the dots from the conversation that we started this morning. Um, so a round of applause for Helen Butler, Luana Brown, Olivia Duncan, Leticia, actually Tamika Ramsey, the Honorable Sheila Tyson, Anaya Vines, Cassandra, uh, um, and Stephanie Williams. And so, who you are seeing here on the stage is an extension of the Black Women's Roundtable and the leaders on the ground. And so what we're going to uh, talk about today is really connecting the dots. Our theme is our bodies and our votes. And so we really want to hear from these state leaders. We want to hear from them what they, what their thoughts and their insights and their views are on the ground because they have a very unique perspective. Um, we need them um, on the ground. And so the conversation and the question that I'm going to ask to the leaders um, on the stage is really about, you know, if you think about where we are right now, we are really in a conversation about the state of black women mid-year, mid-term. Yes or yes? The state of women and the state of black women in particular, mid-year, mid-term. Yes or yes? Is the state of black women 
mid-year, mid-term, right, the state of us. And so the question and the insight that we are looking to hear from you, this illustrious panel, is really three things. And we're going to pass the mic and we're going to try to do this um, expeditiously. You know, Melanie is so generous and she always wants to make sure that the leadership is elevated, and rightfully so. But the question is, um, question number one, is the current state of, of women and reproductive rights. We want to hear from you, in brief, the current state on the ground and where you are as it pertains to reproductive rights. That's question number one. Question number two is then the impact. How does that or will that impact the election and voting and voting rights? That's the impact. And then three, you can leave us with a call to action. Tell us, Commissioner, what we need to do. Like, tell the folks who are streaming, give us one thing that we can do. We don't want to just continue to And I want you to fully understand that this is about power, this is about the grounding of this country, and everything is on the table. Every right that a woman has, they're not only attacking women, they're going to come into LTVGQ, they're going to come into voting rights. This is nothing but a setup to test us to actually see how we're going to do anything. They are going to see how they divide us enough to, to where they can stop us from moving on anything. So you are looking at what's on the table, your children's future, your future, your grandkids' future is on the table. But one thing about this that we can get out of, that doing this at this time, right before the midterm election is a positive. That means that they have showed you women that they have no respect for you. They do not value your opinion. They do not value your vote. That's the reason why all of us, we need to go to the poll and vote them out in mass numbers. This is our opportunity right here to show them our power. We know we got it. Now it's time for us not to only show our husbands. We got to show the White House. We got to show our state house. We got to show our city hall. We got to show down to the comfortable. You got to vote everyone out, whether they black, white, woman, or man, that don't have the same beliefs that we have to put the future in the place where it needs to be for all people. And we are not going back. Round of applause for the Honorable Sheila Tyson, Commissioner of Jefferson County, uh, Alabama Commissioner and Convener of Black Women's Roundtable. Uh, also, thank you. Fortunately, one of the things that, that's happening in our area is that we do still have those reproductive rights for women in Maryland and in D.C. Um, and right now they are getting prepared for the onslaught of women that are going to be coming to the area to receive services. So um, in that regard, I am happy about that. However, um, as she said, we need to fight for our rights back. We cannot, we cannot let this this, this, this go on. You know, we, we already know that this has been in action under, under the table and behind the scenes for years. And now this agenda has come to fruition. And now it is the time that we need to mobilize. Now is the time that we need to talk about all the issues that, that we need to change and we need to get out. We need to vote. Get a bus. Get a van. Put everybody in it that you know is a voting age. Get them to the polls. And as Sheila said, people who do not have your rights in mind, people who do not have your um, personhood in mind, vote them out. 
vote them out and put people in office who share your views, who share your values, and who are going to be looking out, as she said, for all people, not just for a select few. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawana Brown. Good afternoon. I am Stephanie Williams. I'm proud to be the convener of the Black Women Brown But that's a good thing, because we're taking that passivity to the highest level possible. Number one, we're taking care of ourselves. With everything we see that's going on, we're going to be mentally, spiritually, and ready for the fight to secure the time. So we're really taking care of ourselves with coaching, with counseling, looking at uh, issues of, of trauma, so that we can have our folks ready when it comes to mobilizing, strategizing, organizing, running for office and actually helping the candidates that we care about run for office as well. So we're really looking at how do we maintain longevity for black women in our community, especially through our resilience, being able to pivot, whether it's in a pandemic or even a recession where jobs are, are not as plenty and paper as we would want them to be, and then taking those issues like we're sitting at the kitchen table and making it real for us. Those discussions that we're having, changing the narrative about how this truly impacts black women, our families, our households, our men and our communities, especially when it comes to health care, health care access, and how we can counteract all of that through the ballot box. So in short, we're building power. We're coming together collectively, increasing our capacity, supporting black businesses, black-led organizations from grassroots to grass seed, volunteering and mobilizing, educating, and getting out to the vote. And lastly, I'm going to say this. We want to vote for people that look like us, so we need to continue to recruit black women and girls, get them ready for office, train them on how to run campaigns, learn how to collect the data and use that so we have the science so we can continue to win. Because when we win, they push back, we vibrate higher, we keep winning and winning and winning. Wow. All right. Round of applause for Stephanie Williams, convener. Proud of you. That's an awesome um, call to action. And so we invite you to tweet now, share now. We are streaming on Roland Martin Unfiltered. But I think that call to action is a nudge. Is there somebody in your community, a young girl right now, a young woman right now, who you know would be an awesome voice representing us that we could get behind. We have already lined up behind the commissioner's campaign and she hadn't even identified she, that she was running. Two, oh, but like we need, two. you know, it's two always two. the strong sister, the strong woman in the room to encourage, encourage each other. Hey, you run. We I'm will line up behind you. And so, continue uh, with this uh, panel and the discussion. We're going to move over to none other than Tamika Ramsey. So introduce yourself, my sister. Good afternoon. My name is Tamika Ramsey. Hey. Um, I am the convener for Black Women's Roundtable, Eastern Michigan. Black women have not had body autonomy since we set foot on this land. Wow. We were told who to sleep with, what babies to have, wow. what to do with our bodies. We had no choice. And in 1972, the Supreme Court gave us some of that. And then last week, they took it back. My, my, my. Black women should be able to say who they sleep with if they have children. We cannot look at reproductive justice only as an abortion issue. It is more for us. We heard the story of Serena Williams, one of the richest black women in, this, in the world, mm -hmm. famous, almost died after giving birth because the doctors would not listen to her. So it don't matter if we rich black women, as long as we're black, we are on the table and yes. could die at any moment. Yes. That is enough for me to fight for reproductive justice. Yes. I need to be able, my daughter needs to be able to have a child and survive or not have a child and still have a good quality of health that black women in this country have not been able to have. In Michigan, we have a reproductive justice ballot initiative where we are trying to change the constitution yes. of our state to make women of all creed and color able to have body autonomy. That is what we're fighting for. And I'm so sorry that in 2022, 
that women, young girls, have to fight. Yes. Because we've already fought this and won. Mm -hmm. And they got mad. And they came and changed it. And the reason they were able to change it is because the president at the time put people in place. And so now we have to vote for people and put them in position so that we can rectify this problem. Voting is only part of it. Advocating, demonstrating, fighting back, using our dollars or not using our damn dollars. I will not spend a dollar in Texas. Right. Like, no, you cannot have my money if you're telling me that I can die at any moment and you don't care. We have to take control because we are the change and we are the saviors that we're looking for. Nobody else been trying to save black women in no, this country right. but us. That's so right. we have to continue that fight. Thank you. Wow. And a round of applause for the Tamika Ramsey convener, Michigan Black Women's Roundtable. But she said so much that is so powerful. Um, we have not had a body autonomy. Uh, right, so just really level setting the education and the awareness of that and the breaking down of that. But also I would share uh, one other thing that is really important to, to know uh, when Stephanie, you know, says vote for people who look like us and think like us, um, it's important to know what Tamika mentioned is the previous administration put people in office. And so what I heard from a young king, his name is Daryl Cole, um, he's a champion in uh, for black, black, uh, black youth vote, and he says, what am I to say? He says, I understand that there were people put in office to make decisions right now, but it looks like the right now leadership made those decisions. And so, so Tamika, your point of clarity was so necessary. Um, in the room, just say yes or yes. If the clarity was necessary information that we need to empower our communities to say, no, we still need you to vote, um, but also understand what's happening right now is not a right now strategy that there have been people who have been lined up previously, previously um, to make this decision and to begin this battle. So thank you, my sister, for clarifying that. And so again, I'm going to go right to social media because if this information is helpful, it's useful, it's educational, then we just ask you to share online. Just share online this conversation. Share um, and follow uh, these ladies, these women who are champions and generals on the ground, and so we can keep this conversation uh, going. All right? And so now we're going to move over to the next general on the ground. Please introduce yourself, the Helen Butler. Yes. Well, thank you, Dee. What can I say? It's all been said. I'm Helen Butler, convener of the Georgia Black Women's Roundtable. <laughs> In Georgia, we've been on the news, and we're still in the news. In Georgia, women still have reproductive rights to a degree, but what the first thing after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, what did our Attorney General and our Governor of Georgia decided to do was go to court and get the injunction lifted that was in place from starting, from uh, allowing the heartbeat bill, six weeks heartbeat bill, from being implemented. Again, this was because, as someone has already said today, in Georgia, in 2020, we exercised our rights, our power to vote, and elected and changed not only Georgia, but we changed the country by having two U.S. Senators elected. And so what does Georgia do? It came back and put in place a voter suppression bill called SB202. But despite that, we still had a large turnout. We're educating people about the problems and the barriers that are in place. But we are not going to let them steal our joy. Right. Because we understand that power that we have in our vote, numbers matter. Yes. Did you hear me? Yes. Numbers matter. Numbers so matter. if we turn out in massive numbers, 
we can overturn all of these barriers that they're trying to put in place. So we've got to be good stewards. Someone said earlier in the panel that we must act 365 days a year. So we've got to register people to vote. Yes. We've got to educate people yes. about the issues, about the candidates, and then we got to mobilize them. Yes. You've got to get them to the polls to turn out to vote. But the other thing is, we've got to protect that right yes. to vote. Yes. In Georgia, they decided to change the composition of officials who implement election laws. And they'll be doing it for other things as well. But guess what? You can become an election official. So be a poll worker, be a poll monitor, be out there assisting the voters to exercise their right to vote. Call 866-OUR-VOTE. It's a national hotline that you can get your problems answered. So don't be deterred, 866-OUR-VOTE. We're there to make sure you're engaged. And as Dr. Lowry said, voting is a sacred right, but it is also a moral obligation. So, ladies, black women, we are a majority in Georgia. We can rule. Women are 52% of the voters, registered voters. So we have the power to do anything we want. Power. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! Yes. And none other, that was the Helen Butler Convener Georgia Black Women's Roundtable. Thank you so much, um, Helen. We're going to move to the back. Hello, I am Olivia Duncan. I am an organizer for Georgia Stand Up. And I just want to say, first and foremost, thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, thank you, Black, Black Women's Roundtable um, and Black Youth Vote for allowing myself and my sister Anaya to take up this space and not only be educated, but amplify the voices of the Black youth. Um, in Georgia, like Ms. Butler said, uh, it's, not, it's not doing well. Um, we've been experiencing voter suppression since 2019, since 2018, since 2020, since 2021, and now again in 2022. Um, the college students have been experiencing this since my freshman year, when we were trying to uh, vote for Stacey Abrams, and we did everything to mobilize and organize and get to the polls, and got to the polls, and they said that we're at the wrong polls. Then there were issues at the polls, and it's the polling times have closed, and we missed it. So it's time for us to change that. Same with reproductive justice. Um, the heartbeat bill was signed back in 2019 and here it is back again in our faces and it's time for that to change. Um, it's time to vote these people out. I know that this can be discouraging for the youth to want to go vote when we see that these people are still not making decisions in our favor but it's time for us to step up and br bridge the gap and educate ourselves and encourage ourselves to go and make these changes. Black youth vote. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi. If everyone can repeat after me, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Thank you. That's the second thing. But hello everyone, my name is Anaya Vines. I am a graduate of Howard University. Um, <laughs> Um, I am also the founder of a nonprofit organization called the Live Movement, a national HBCU coalition, standing on the foundation that we must live for those who have died. Um, shout out to Miss Melanie, shout out to Black Women's Roundtable, to Georgia Stand Up, Miss Deborah Scott. Thank you so, so much, and of course, Black Youth Vote. 
Um, uh, action item that I would say for those of my generation and those that are coming after me, just because the Roe v. Wade might not directly affect your state does not mean it does not affect you. Yes. When one woman's rights is affected, all women's rights are affected. Yes. That means that they do not look at us as women as people. Our human rights are being affected. So I believe since 1972, behind the scenes, there has been active movement so that here, at the time of 2022, Roe v. Wade is overturned. They have not stopped. So we cannot stop. Yes. Our generation cannot stop. Yes. Our leaders cannot stop. Particularly our black students cannot stop. I look at HBCUs and I see a, pl a plethora of opportunities because you have one space in which black students, when men and women come together, they are at an age where they can vote. Yes. That is a prime opportunity to mobilize. So my organization focuses on training for mobilization on campus and off campus. These are prime opportunities. So I believe that if we focus on mobilizing students in particular and just uplifting HBCU students for doing that, I feel like there will definitely be a push in the voting polls. And also, just to be completely frank, and I was thinking, should I really say this, but a lot of people don't understand, especially those that overturned Roe v. Wade, just because that's been overturned, that does not mean abortions are going to stop. Let's be completely honest, especially black women, we know there are various ways of aborting children, but Roe v. Wade being overturned means that the, the path to a healthy way of abortion is not, is not available for us anymore. So let's please just support one another, though again, it might not be affecting your direct state, does not mean it affects you. If our rights are under attack, we must stand up and fight back because no one's going to fight for us but us. And that was the Anaya Vines. We are so uh, grateful for you, organizer of the live movement and BYV, uh, Howard University, ASU. Oh, come on, sis, you did yeah. that. And so we are grateful for you and Miss Olivia Duncan, organizer as well, Georgia Stand Up BYV. Thank you so very much. And so, so much has been said, uh, but while we have a few remaining uh, moments, I wanna give the floor um, to you all, the leaders, in terms of what has not been said that needs to be said as it pertains to our bodies and our votes and taking your hands uh, off our bodies and our votes. What hasn't been said that needs to be said in terms of impact uh, on the midterm election and the call to action is really important. So with our final few minutes, uh, anyone who wants to chime in, go right ahead. Yes. Um I think that we need to talk to white women. Just, just, t just lay it on the table. Mm -hmm. Because they married to the ones that's actually passing these bills. You gonna tell me well, that your daughters, all of their lives is, is at stake, but you have no control and no power in your own home? You can't tell me that. Start closing those bedroom doors. Uh-oh. In your what? legs while you're at it. <laughs> what? And what? then open your mouth and tell them what? That they are not going to treat women like this yeah. because that bill affects your life whether you believe it or not. You don't know whether it's going to affect your child, your grandkids, your niece, your church member. White women, you got to stand up with us and you got to fight with us and let these men know that they are wrong and they cannot control your vote and your power. Because it was disrespectful to white women, just like it was for other women. So I was, me and Sheila the same person. <laughs> I was going to say very similar to the same thing. This country is made up of 13.7% black people. If all of us voted our values, we still need the help of white people. Yes. Dr. Another Martin Luther color. King talked about the white progressive. If you are not helping us, you are in our way. And that's the simple conversation. I have white friends, we have difficult conversations all the time. Because if I can't have these conversations with you, you are not my friend. If I am fighting these battles by myself, you are not my friend. And we have to call people out. Yes. If you are not fighting with me, you are in my way. If you are not helping us, you are allowing us to be killed. We need to get a backbone. We need to say, we, I'm not dealing with you. 
and be okay with that. And then support the ones who want to learn, right? Because this cannot be the suffrage movement all over again. It cannot be we working together as women until white women get what they want and then they leave black women behind. Black women not going for that shit no more. And I've been trying not to catch that. We just not doing that no more. So we have to start having those difficult conversations. That white coworker that came up to you in tears with Roe v. Wade, girl, how your mama vote? Did she vote for Trump? Did she vote? Let's have those conversations because that's how we are truly going to move this country forward, right, right. right there. All right. Powerful, powerful, and we needed that. We needed the conversation to open up, and not is not going to be a comfortable conversation. So I'm grateful for these leaders here. And as we uh, wrap up, I'm going to say because this is a room um, live of of us, right, women, and then we do have a live stream audience. But again, with the comment of expanding the conversation and. Um, speaking with other women, uh, white women, and even Asian women, and Latinas, and all women, um, we really need to start that here. So we are streaming uh, live now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. We are also streaming live on uh, NCBCP Black Women's Roundtable on Facebook. And so we want to ask you right now, again, to share online. We'd like to have a conversation. We need a broader conversation. As uh, Commissioner Sheila Tyson mentioned and Tamika Ramsey, we need to have a broader conversation, a unified conversation, if we're going to continue the conversation and advocate for hands off our bodies and hands off our vote. So if you could go um, to, again, online, uh, follow, NCBCP underscore BWR to engage others in the conversation. That's the one thing that we would ask. And for those of you who are streaming in the chat right now, whatever it is that you think needs to be said or added to the conversation, we invite you to chime in. We invite you to share. Hit the share button um, so that we can expand the conversation. And so, um, that said, we are going to wrap up. I'm going to give uh, uh, the leaders, uh, whoever has a pressing final thought. Yep, we're going to give the floor to you for this conversation. So, Stephanie, if that's you, the floor is yours. Thank you, DC. I just wanted to say that at this point, we really need to change the narrative. The conversations we need to have in the streets are the same ones we have at our kitchen table. Talk to your mothers, your grandmothers, the younger girls about reproductive justice the right to have a child, to not have a child, to raise that family in a safe community, a welcoming community, the right to be able to go to work and not have to deal with oppression and microaggressions and all those other things that keep us in an unhealthy state. We have to continue perpetuating these real conversations that marinate in the spirit of black women and younger girls so we feel comfortable out in the community talking about and projecting our issues to expand our movement that inspires more women and girls to be more proactive, to participate, and to lead. And I hear women say all the time, well, I don't want to run for office. I don't want to be in the front. That's all right, sis. We got a lot of room for you on the side, in the office, in the suite, wherever you want to be. There's room for tools, for technology, for folks who can do research, who can write grants, who can help write, you know, speeches, do social media. There is work for everybody to do. And this fight is ours because it's about power. It's about black women and girls and our power maintaining what we have and building on what we have to look forward in the future. It's about supporting black entrepreneurs, black businesses locally and globally, making sure that we're expanding the power of our money, of our dollars, and making sure that we're maintaining home ownership, make sure that we are, are growing capacity. So I just want to say that don't be afraid to have these conversations in the streets. You can be in the streets, just don't get caught up in the streets. But be in the streets talking about what really matters. Tweet. Make, make your status on social media. Go on Instagram, Snapchat, and talk about the real ish. Stand in your truth, speak your power, mobilize, organize, vote, and still keep having those conversations because it is about us. Um, I would also say 
I'm very loud. You guys can hear me. No, um, we're streaming. No, we're streaming. <laughs> we're going to ask okay. you yeah, to wrap it, and okay. then we're going to transition. Right. Awesome. Um, I would say to those, especially around my age, please, please, please educate yourself. Don't just think that scrolling on social media, on your TL, that means you are updated on everything women's rights. That is not the case. If we want to adequately fight for us and for women in particular, black women specifically, we need to know what we're fighting against. We need to know the history of women's rights. We need to understand that at the front of every revolution, there has always been black women. We have been the foundation. We have been the backbone of every major change in America, even before the, the, the creation of America. It has been us. So making sure that we educate ourselves, don't take just what, whatever anyone says to us as bond, but making sure that everything that we have in our brains, we are doing the research to make sure that we are actually making change for our people. So please, please, please educate yourself, not just social media, but let's hype up some stuff, let's do some research and get the job done. Awesome, a round of applause for this amazing panel. And as we transition, a round of applause for this awesome panel. Thank you so much for your voice, your thoughts, your insights. And as they uh, take their seats and we transition to the next panel, I say black women, you say power table. Black women. Power table! Black women. Power table! As I say black women, you say power table. As they transition and take their seats, black women. Power table! Black women. Power table! Black women, black women, black women, black women, black women, awesome, awesome. And now I want to invite Delisa Sanders, uh, Senior Policy Advisor, National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and Black Women's Roundtable to round out our day and we are going to be complete. We will be brief. And this, the National Leaders Roundtable. So round of applause for uh, Dr. Delisa Sanders. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Will the next panelist please come to, the, come to the front? Will our next panelist please come to the front? We are going to pivot now from our communities in our states. We're now going to pivot our minds, hearts, minds, bodies, and hearts and spirits onto the national stage. What can we do at the national level? And hopefully throughout this conversation, see and feel the connection between what goes on in our communities actually ends up at the national. They're all connected for it to work. Come on, my sisters, my sisters. How you doing? <laughs> you look gorgeous. Hey, oh, look at all these crowns. Oh, my Lord. Okay. Y'all ready? Yeah. Y'all ready? Okay. How poetic it is to be here in this moment. Well, within a week, the Supreme Court of the United States <laughs> made decisions that are rolling back the clock on our federal protections, on our rights and our freedom. How, how poetic that we just witnessed history and Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson becoming the first black Supreme Court justice. I am going to ask each of our panelists to give us your own self-introduction, which includes your name and your organization, 
but something very powerful and impactful that you would like to share with us. This is what happens when you start in the, sit in the first seat. Um, hello, y'all. Um, my name is Nerve Say Flint. I am the Senior Director of Black Leadership and Engagement at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. We are the largest healthcare provider in terms of reproductive and sexual health, not only in the US, but the world. Um, and what was the second part of that question? Or it was just introductions? Okay. All right, um, so I'm uh, here, I'm happy to hear, I come out of Los Angeles, California. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, been a long time into the reproductive justice movement and so really excited um, and also heartbroken broken to talk about where we are today. So, thank you, Delisa. Uh, I am Felicia Davis. I am the proud convener of the Clayton County, Georgia Black Women's Roundtable. The yeah. county in Georgia that put a new crew in, in position. And I am also the founder of the HBCU Green Fund, where I work to green black colleges. And I am so pleased to be here, learning now that the future is indeed black, and uh, climate change is real. And so as we talk about the quartet and move forward in terms of these um, Supreme Court decisions, mm -hmm. um, there's one that I will particularly lean into. And so with that, I will pass the mic. Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm, I'm Jocelyn Fry, and I'm the president of the National Partnership for Women and Families in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you. Um, thank you, Melanie, for your leadership in convening us. Thank you, Delisa, and your work. Um, and the, the National Partnership is a 51-year-old women's organization, um, and I am its third president. I'm its first black woman president. Yes. Um, and, and it's exciting to be here, and we work on a range of issues. But you asked us to introduce ourselves, and I think in many ways, the most important thing for you to know about me is that I am the daughter of Lily and Kenneth Fry. Mm -hmm. You may not know them. Um, and they have now gone uh, uh, on to uh, uh, their makers. But that tells you as much as you need to know about mm -hmm. me. Um, they were both, um, they grew up in segregation. They both moved to Washington. They became federal government workers and they sacrificed enormously to give me every opportunity. I am most assuredly sitting here with you today because of that. I'm um, going to places and being in spaces that they never thought that certainly they would be or that I would be. So I carry that legacy proudly, um, and I think in many ways that's the most important thing to know about how I got here. Thank you. Peace and blessings, everybody. Uh, my name is, well, first, of all, first giving honor to the beautiful black women in this room. I'm really grateful to be in this space. Thank you, Melanie, always for creating these opportunities for black women to gather in such a powerful way. But my name is Monica Simpson. I'm the executive director of Sister Song. We are the National Reproductive Justice Collective for Women of Color and Folks. Yeah. Um, and uh, about me, so I am a country girl born and raised in rural North Carolina. Um, and I have been organizing and doing work in the South my entire life. Um, I am a fine-ass auntie. I take that very seriously. I love being an auntie. Um, and I am also a proud black lesbian. Happy Pride. We just wrapped up Pride Month. So that's very important. I, that's important, the identity of who I am and how I do the work that I do. And um, I am a true lover of black folks. And I do this work because my love for black folks runs so deep and so yeah, it's just an honor to be on this panel with all these beautiful folks, and I'm excited to get in this conversation. All right. Now, I, I want to examine things, again, from the, from the national stage. And again, keeping in mind, with, with, the, with the Supreme Court, some of the decisions around our reproductive rights, impacting our voting rights, and, it, and ruling that the Environmental Protection Agency can't protect the environment. That's like, yeah. what? Okay, so... On a national stage, we are all, always looking at U.S. Congress, right? 
And we're also looking at the midterm election. What can Congress and we also and the Biden Harris administration do right now to protect our rights in spite of what just happened? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start. Yeah. Um, I'm sure other people will weigh people will weigh in. Um, you know, I, I think. Um, there's no mincing words that what the Supreme Court did was devastating, um, and intentionally so. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, you can't sort of eliminate a right and not have a powerful effect. That being said, um, there are things the administration can do. Um, now we are hearing about states that want to restrict the right to travel. Um, the administration can be clear, and I think the Department of Justice has spoken about the importance of making sure that people know that they can do, they, they have a right to travel. This is a constitutionally protected right. Nobody should believe that they cannot travel from one jurisdiction to another, um, and they should make that clear with every state. Um, the other issue that comes up is that people, I think, have a sometimes outdated notion of abortion and abortion care. There are a range of, range of ways to access abortion, including through medications, um, and it is important to have that access preserved. Again, the Department of Justice has already spoken up and said that if people want to utilize different medications that are FDA approved, um, that they have the right to access those medications through the mail, and they're willing to stand up for those protections. That's really important. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, there are other implications around access to contraception and um, just other health care services. There are some requirements under the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. um, and even under Medicaid and people's ability to access those sorts of services. So I think that the administration can do a lot to speak up on that, but I also think that they just have to be bold and unequivocal that this is a ruling that cannot stand. Right. Like we, sh we should not accept it as anything but a politically driven effort to deny women and people who give birth their rights. And they need to be bold and loud and consistent in saying we will fight it. We will fight it at every place we can because it is unacceptable and it is inconsistent with what we know about the Constitution and our rights generally. But that's where they can start. I think you said that so beautifully, and I'm so glad you said it first, because I, I don't have the nice words to say what I think they need to do, right? I just think this administration needs to boss up. Like, like that's what they need to do. They need to, like, stop playing this, like, little pit a pat -a game and actually take off the gloves and do the work. Right? So yes, we have our role to play. I know we're gonna talk about voting and the power of that, and all of that's important, but if we don't have folks who are willing to stand in the ways that we need them to, like unapologetically, like by any means necessary kind of attitude, then why are you in this office, right? I don't understand. So I think I, I'm coming with, I, I appreciate those who can like put it with me, like give us the right things to say, and I lean on these folks right here. Because I'm ready to say, get off your asses and actually do the work that you were put in your position to do. Our previous administration used everything and then some to put us in the situation that we are in. Why are we not doing the same thing and not trying to say we're trying to be like the opposition, but it is important for our people to use their power that they have to the full ex fullest extent of that and do that thing for real, y'all. So I, th I think I'm, I'm coming with a lot of fire today in case y'all haven't noticed, um, but I'm ready for them to boss up. Anything else? So, so I just want to jump in so that we don't get confused. So, you know, if we looked at the Washington Post, they said a trifecta. So we're looking at Roe v. Wade, we're looking at EPA, we're looking at an interesting border decision. And before that, it was guns everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we divide up, and my sisters to the left, it going in hard on Roe, and we know the impact. But this is like, you know that thing of you got to know your history or you'll repeat it? This folks. That's right. This a bunch of folks that always had an agenda with a very, very few. So I want some white folks to understand, though you weren't included either. They're coming, they're coming up for yours as well. 
the folks on the plantation, there wasn't a whole lot of folks in the big house. It was just a little crew over there and everybody else served them. So that was the plan. And now there's a, a, a movement to say, how can we, the few, control the rest? And everybody, so the only way that can happen is if some of us work on road, and some of us work on the environment, uh -huh. and some of us work on that, uh -huh. and we miss the bigger picture. And then the other thing is our numbers. They got black folks in the mindset that we like 13%. I travel, and I, everywhere I go there's black people, everywhere. I go to South America, there's black people. I go to Africa, there's a lot more black people. I go to Europe, there's plenty of black folks. So the, the issue and what time it is, we have to understand that we got to make the leap forward. We can't do what we've done. And we have to set an agenda for these young people that enables them to reach for the future. We gonna hold it down. As, and those of us that are in the blue states, where you can get pills, the best thing I heard, you can buy a lot of them if you can afford to, so that we can distribute where they need to be. It's like, I, I am gangster. So we come to gangster, <laughs> dealing with a sister in the situation. We gonna drive you, we gonna provide you, we gonna do, we done it for other stuff. And look, I'm not trying to party and get high, I'm trying to save a life. So we got to be there and let it be known. If you come for me, you come for all of us. That's it. So that's, that's, that's what time it is. Cause this is that's not, nice. this is not a situation. We want to, would that it would be just about abortion. It is not, you want the whole body. Mm -hmm. You want my body again. And on the strip of the women that I know that served in that way, not this time, not this time. All right, did y'all hear that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I feel like everything is, <laughs> that is, everything is said, is already said, so ditto everything that folks have said. Um, I w the only thing that I would just raise again, and I don't pick up where you put down, is that we need to be intersectional and creative. So what does that mean? That means that even though this conversation is about abortion access, we know that black women are not just about abortion access, and abortion access is not just about abortion. That's it's an good. economic issue, it's an environmental issue, it's a criminal justice issue, it's all these other things that come into our lives. So our administration not only should be thinking about Roe, it should also be thinking about how do we make sure that the lives of black women, regardless if they want to uh, uh, have an abortion and or keep their pregnancy, right, that they are creating the conditions for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So we also need to be keeping them accountable of what does it mean to have fair pay. We also need to be keeping them accountable. What does it mean to also have um, paid parental leave? What does it mean for us to be thinking about this full range of things so folks can actually give themselves options? Because abortion access is more than about, oh, well, I just woke up and I just don't want to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. Even though sometimes that is that, the question, or sometimes mm -hmm. that is the answer. Abortion access is about all the pieces because we know that most people who have abortions are already parents, right? We know that, so they are making, and most times they are making economical decisions. So how do we also address those issues as well? So when we, when folks tell you that there is nothing to do because of the Congress and the way it's at, don't believe them. That's right. Tell them that there are many things that they could be doing around abortion access. There are many things that can be doing around reproductive and sexual health access. And it doesn't just stop at one piece of legislation or one court case. Mm -hmm. That's very important. But I, I'm hearing a common thread is tell Congress, tell Congress, which pivots me into where we're headed. We're headed to the midterm election. Well, we vote folks in and we vote folks out. What should we be thinking about right now, also planning, preparing to do for the midterm to impact what's going on? 
I'm going to start first. Yeah. first. Yes, ma'am. I don't want to follow y'all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of pieces. Um, one, we, of course, we need to get out and vote. Um, but we also need to hold our folks accountable. I think it's, it's no secret that black women vote. And we vote at high numbers. We get out there, black, older black women are more seasoned black women, are one of the highest, highest propensity voters in the country, right? But we need to also make sure that our vote is getting paid off after they get into office. So what do we also do after the voting? How are we holding them accountable? Are we asking them questions? What are you doing? How are you helping black folks? And then after, make sure that they are actually holding, back, holding the folks accountable. We can be asking elected officials right now, where are your stance on abortion access? Where is your stance on all these issues? Just because you came to my church doesn't mean that you got my back. So we need to be also having all of those conversations and having them answer to, to, to black women in particular and black birthing folks. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first piece. I think the second one, this is not normal times. So we can't be acting normally. So that means that we gotta again, think big and creative on how we are engaging with our people. So that means we might have to have round table discussions in our in our living rooms. We might have to have round table discussions in our bedrooms. We need to be making sure that all folks are aligned and having conversations. So you got cousin and them coming to the elections and coming to the polls with you and asking those same questions. So I'm so glad to know that I'm at the end of the stage with the not normal, cause see, <laughs> so I, I sat in the right chair because while I'm working to get everybody to everybody that I can to vote. We have the opportunity to lift up things. We can say, oh, your choice is this. And we have a Reverend Warnock from Ebenezer that's articulate, art educated, it, the examples. So it's like, you can go with this or you can go with that. I want to be a little bit ahead. So where I am in the current, let's make voting mandatory for anybody that gets a government amount or pays taxes. Now it's not gonna probably happen, but that's my position. Let's make voting mandatory. What is that? That is going beyond where we are. And then I want the people with the Constitution to explain, let them get on the page and no, we don't want to do that because they've had me running against a flow. So I want to change the flow of the river and say, anytime we're in a state where people can visibly try to tear down the government, we need that big change that you're talking about in a bigger vision. So make it mandatory. So in my conversation with young people, I'm saying, yeah, I'm working hard to make sure you're going to have to vote. So you might as well practice now. And, and that's the way. But And thinking that's ahead, because we keep on fighting from the rear. While people, and and any time we win, folks start shooting. So we have to have an analysis that deals with all white men wanting to have it all for themselves only. And, and a strategy that, yes, we get our community to turn out because we show the example. What we pick is better than what others pick. And we move from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well. Uh, now I have the challenge of following you. Um, you know, I completely agree with what they have said. I, you know, I think um, what I would say to anybody, in addition to obviously vote and why that's important, is that all of the issues that we work on are connected to each other. Um, it is not just about your issue. And we have to get out of the mindset that as long as I have what I want or I have my issue protected, that I'm not affected. That's not true, and we have to be clear that even though the conversation at the moment is about abortion and abortion access because of the Roe decision, that is not the only reason why they are fight. They fought on Roe. 
that was not the only reason that they stacked the Supreme Court. This is a conversation about power and about control. Um, you know, if you look at the decision from Justice Alito, um, he, you know, he tries to dress it up, but he talks very little about women. <laughs> doesn't say much about all the issues that we care about, doesn't say anything about that, tries to just say, this is just a little bit about abortion. We're not going to touch all these other issues. And, and it's a deceptive ruse to make us try to not understand that what this is really about is just putting the, the power in the hands of a handful of people in the states, mostly white men, who are against all of our issues. Right. The same people who are pushing anti-abortion restrictions are pushing anti-climate restrictions. They're pushing anti, you know, ACA restrictions. They're pushing, you know, all the anti-voting. This is about power, and the way that you push back on that is that you leverage your own power. Right. They're fighting so hard because they see the writing on the wall. Right. You know, our numbers, whatever people say our numbers are, they know that if we work together and we collaborate and we, we you know, don't pay attention to their narrative and just fight, we will win. Right. Like that's what that's part of what happened in Georgia. So I, I think that it's important for us to vote and understand that we work together. We move together. That if one person gets left behind, then that's not satisfactory because next time it could be us. Um, and we have to understand what the, what the fight is about. The fight is about control and power, right? It's not just about singular issues. It's really about who gets to control our bodies, right? Like who gets to control how we live, how we breathe. Um, that's what the fight is about. And, and, and we, so we have to be clear about that. Um, and I think if we are clear about that, if we get out of our silos and we work together, we can accomplish meaningful change. So for the midterms, you seem to amplify our issues, to be very clear about it and why we're voting, and also to connect with others and have a thread between us instead of be separate. Absolutely, and, and, and that we have to work together, right? Like I may not work on climate issues, but I understand we need to work together. We may need, I may need to be in a state that I'm not normally in mm -hmm. and work on that issue because at the end of the day, um, it, is, it is part and parcel of the same problem. Right. That's a good point, especially at the national level, because we all want our, our name and, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, that's so real. I really appreciate you saying that because, you know, I know that we're having like this national conversation and it's like we are these national organizations that have, you know, name recognition and like the ability to like really reach, you know, lots of folks like in one thing. And I think it's important for us as national organizations, and this is something we try to do very intentionally at Sister Song, to not move our voice without making sure that, you know, our members, our folks that we're working with at the state level, that they are actually moving that agenda for us, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're not moving our own agenda. It's like we are doing everything possible to have that direct connection to folks on the ground so that we, when we're bringing out messaging, when we're talking about different things, and it's not just coming from us, but it's coming from the folks who are most impacted and most directly um, connected to the issue. So I just think that's important to name as like national organizations, um, not to have that fly-in approach to just say, we're showing up, but it's like, how are we really building those relationships with folks on the ground mm -hmm. to then be able to really influence and impact the way that we do the work? Mm -hmm. And I think everything that my sisters just said about like why these, this midterm election is so important is on point. And I think that one thing that's really exciting about this time for me when I think about what's going to go down with this election season is that for once, they can't ignore this question around sexual and reproductive health and bodily autonomy. It is going to be impossible for any person looking and seeking office to get on a platform and not have to have their stance clear, right? Um, they can't dance around this issue anymore because of what has happened with this decision. And so I think that that is going to give us some clear indications on where people's values are and where they lie. And I think that is going to help us as we start to think about what candidates that we need to like really move forward in leadership and the ones that we don't. So that's one opportunity that I see mm -hmm. that I just wanted to add to everything that my sisters have already just said. Okay, and we've just had someone join us full of joy. Yes. Grace and beauty. I'm asking you to do a self-introduction. Yeah. And we're talking about, um, we're looking at things on a, on a 
federal level and on a national level. Yes. And after you introduce yourself to everyone, help us understand what we should be doing uh, with Congress right now. What yeah. more can Congress be doing right now, given all the, in particular, the recent Supreme Court decisions? Yeah. And the Biden Harris administration, they have power right now. Right. So my name is Joy Cheney, and I bring you greetings always on behalf of forever mayor of New Orleans, uh, Mark Morial. <laughs> Just left him. That's why I'm running a smidge late, and I apologize. Thank you for your graciousness. I run the Washington Bureau, so I, I head the policy and the advocacy arm of the National Urban League, and it's my privilege always to join you here. With my sisters on the stage, we're always doing stuff together. So, you know, in terms of what Congress should be doing, they got to get rid of the filibuster. I mean, and so you might say, well, why, what does that have to do with abortion? What does that have to do with voting rights? It has everything to do with it. And it also has to do with what Jocelyn was saying a few minutes ago. This is really about a minority population, a minority group, trying to make sure that they can counteract and that they are using the levers of power in Congress, in the courts, the Electoral College, to make sure that even with a minority of votes and minority of people, that they can control. It's modern day apartheid. And we have to recognize what's going on. It doesn't really matter the topic. It matters to us. It matters to the people who are going to be influenced. But to them, it's all one and the same. And the first people who were identifying this as a, as a through line were black women. We've been saying, guys, something else is going on here. This isn't about abortion alone. This isn't about voting rights alone. This isn't about gay marriage alone. This is about states' rights. This is about trying to control, you know, a minority trying to control what the majority does. And so we have a filibuster that means that even though we have a majority of people in Congress, we have to have a supermajority, 60 people. Where in any other place do you need 60 people to move things forward? And as Martin Luther King said, as we're saying today, the filibuster is an existential threat to democracy. We cannot, it's why we can have gun laws um, blocked, unless you have a very benign one. Um, block is why you can have that. It's why you can have a block on, on the, the codification of Roe bill. It's why you can have a block on the voting rights bills that all of us fought so hard for. So Congress has got to figure something out around the filibuster create a new rule about that, and we need the senators who are going to make that happen. And in terms of the president, in addition to continuing to fight for the filibuster, he's kind of allowed, you know, those the, a desire to see a change on specific issues, but I think we're going to have to talk about it holistically. But I think the president is also going to have to talk about what is really happening. The only people that I hear making all the connections are black people. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I have, they know it's happening. Republicans will tell you it's happening. And black people, I include Clarence Thomas. He decided to tell us what was happening, much to their chagrin, in his concurrence. I can't. I know. And it's great. Right. Black people of all stripes yeah. <laughs> are just telling the truth about what's happening. We need the president of the United States to claim it and to talk about it, what's really going on, and that this is almost a modern civil war. I mean, boss up. So we need to have a, to have a talk. We need to have a talk with the president. Yeah, it's not just about each individual issue. That no. can divide us, because on any given topic, but it's not like the issue, it's just about. It's about the overarching the whole strategy thing. that's at play here. I think talking is so great. It just, it just hit me right now. Like, I think we got to talk to the president. We got to talk to these people. And there's a piece of me, like, I'm bringing, I'm trying to bring my most authentic self into this conversation with you all today that's tired of talking. Like, mm -hmm. like what is that thing that we are actually going to do, right? And so when, when you brought in this notion of, like, the modern-day apartheid, right, like, I really appreciate you saying that because... I think that we're going to have to start looking to our global partners and how they have had to handle like those 
you know, the, those, the, those authorities that were over them and how they've had to like really do that collective work and build that collective power to actually make the change happen from movements, from people. Like we can't, of course the Supreme Court has showed us that the, the, the courts ain't gonna save us. Uh, we have everything showing us that the people who are in power are tied, hands are tied behind their backs. They're not saving us. So the movement and the power is gonna come from the people. And so I just, I also just wanted to bring that energy into this conversation that we're not going to win this fight by policy alone. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna win this fight by voting alone. We're going to have to put that people power behind it and that movement building power behind it so that they can actually know that we are for real and you cannot deny the power of the people. Like when you see that in mass, when you see that collectively, there's no denying that. And we've seen the pictures globally of when there are millions of people in the street together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Advocating against a thing or trying to move a thing. And that has literally changed entire governmental structures in global countries. We have to think about what that means in the United States of America too. I agree, street heat. That's what I call it, street heat. Come on. We need a lot more street heat. But you, you asked about Biden and Harris. And I, my mind is sitting here thinking, what could Joe Biden do? And I'm stuck, so I'm gonna park that one. Mm -hmm. But I do think that Vice President Kamala Harris can show up hard as a sister, right? She can, she can show up as a sister, which is, a, a, I, I understand what I'm asking, right? Because the journey there is that you kind of subdue or suppress that a bit. But in this particular moment where I said, they're coming for my babies, they're coming for my bodies, and they've been coming for my brothers, mm. right? Mm. So at, at, at this moment, I think if she were to step forward, just as a black, South Asian, but black woman, that's what she could do for all of us. Because we understood first time out why we couldn't exactly have that because you have to be for everybody. But now we understand if we're for ourselves, that's the first step in being for everybody because anything else is disingenuous on some level. So right now, I'm thinking about, oh, how can I work in a manner that builds more space for her to do that? Because I think in that moment that could galvanize a power that we possess. And when we say do something, part of that doing, sister, we gotta be quiet about it. Cause we've been announcing. We've been announcing we're gonna march and announce we're gonna do stuff. And then, you know, yeah, yeah. people can meet you there. But so we have to do some analysis. But if our sister would show up, if I was to send a message to the White House, I don't know what Joe could do, right? It just, he doesn't strike me like that, but I think she could. There we go. What we're hearing, we need to, we need to show up. We need to make sure that our voices are heard. We need to be very clear, look people straight in the eye. We voted you in, we can vote you out and that we mobilize. We mobilize and we keep making noise and demand and fight back. We just can't, I, I agree. That's, that's basically the, the sentiment that we have. I wanna close on a, on a, on a, a high note, a, a really <laughs> nice note. I would like to know in one word what you felt um, when you witnessed Judge Katanji Ron Jackson being sworn in as the first black woman yeah. on the Supreme Court of the United States. Just one word that expresses how you felt in that historic moment. You want me to start? Yeah, go ahead, Joy. You've asked this question before. Mm -hmm. She's a great moderator. She always asks this is good. Mm -hmm. I think the last time that you asked this, yes, I said <laughs> But you know what I'm gonna say today? Relief. Mm. I feel like, see, look, we know that she's not gonna solve all problems, that it's mm. not profitable. Um, and she won't agree with every one of us in every way that we want. But I'm relieved because I know that someone, not only qualified, competent, but compassionate mm -hmm. and authentic, 
and sort of just in command of her craft is in the court. Yeah. And who is there about the Constitution, <laughs> right? And, and about the American people mm -hmm. and not on some ideological uh, bent. And so I am relieved that at least she understands the assignment. Mm. I gotta say two words. I mean, I'm proud. Like, I mean, come on, sister, with your locks, and you just you just look extra black. Your name is extra black. Everything about that is exciting to me, right? Like, super proud. Like, go you. And the other word is bittersweet, because time and time again, black women are put in these positions to have to hold the moral high ground, to have to, you know, put all of our energy into like being in the midst in the sea of white supremacy, trying to make change. And I just want to hug the sister. I want to make sure that she knows that she is being hugged and loved on by as many black women as possible, because what she is being asked to do right now is not fair. It's not, right? And so, yes, proud, I'm gonna put my fists in the air and do all the things to celebrate this amazing historic accomplishment. And I know what she is asked to do and where she is asked to sit and how she is asked to do it should not be what black women should have to deal with in the United States of America. Yet we, have, we are continuously putting our bodies, putting our minds, putting our communities, putting everything on the line just for our own freedom and liberation. And we've been doing that for decades. And I'm tired of that having to be our narrative. So I'm going to hold on to the proud, but I'm just going to acknowledge the bittersweetness of that too. You know, I would say hopeful um, because I think that um, even in the midst of all of the challenges that we confront, um, I can still hold on to the fact that this brilliant black woman is now seated on a court where she had every right to be. Um, she was hands down the most qualified person, one of the most qualified nominees ever. Uh, uh, she's, she's more qualified, quite frankly, than some of the people she'll be seated with, right? And, 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 there, and she stands on the shoulder of a legacy of black women who should have preceded her. Um, so even in the midst of all of the things that people are doing to take away our power, you know, I'm, I remain hopeful because, because there she is, and that's important. And um, it's, it's a glimmer of hope. Um, and we need to hold on to that hope because there's so much that people are doing to try to take away those opportunities. And, and her presence there is important for us, but it's important for all the people who, and young people who will come behind. Um, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful um, and uh, uh, it just gives, you know, a little bit of joy. Absolutely. One word. So my one word would be blessed because I live to see it ah. and then for me like I share in it it's just like that you know people say I am Katanji I've been rolling around ever since like I really am Katanji I can't wait for Keisha to get there with her and 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 then little Jamal gonna come on in and we're gonna really turn it around so I am feeling really really validated because I walk around saying the reason why we show so hard is because we are the best and the brightest period. I mean, yes. Best and the brightest period and the best and the brightest are given assignments because what other group of people could have carried the assignment? I'm saying globally the assignment I, I mean from South Central to South Africa. We carried the assignment and we tried to bring humanity up and forward. Yeah. And Katanji has got it. She is the hope of the nation. Without that, we're gonna need another constitution. I'm working on that. Anybody interested? We get over in the small room later on. But um, because sometimes you can't repair a document if you were included at the beginning, because I was never, you know, three fifths, I was six fifths. Mm. Well, well, close us out. I was like, dang, again. <laughs> you got this, no baby. Oh. I think um, I want to 
I'm gonna ditto the hopefulness. Um, I think this is because although I am saddened that black girl magic has to exist in the sense of we have to be resilient in ways um, that is sometimes extraordinary, right? Um, and the toll that it takes on us. Um, but I am a deep believer in it. And I know even though it's just one person, but that one person, that one, I believe in the power of black women and that one person, even though it's not going to radically change the court, um, to have that voice in there, to have representation in there, to have somebody who can bring voice to the natural hair conversation or whatever we need to have conversation is hopeful for me. And that it will send a message, and it does send a message to a whole bunch of generation of folks to say, I think I can be there too. Well said, well said. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for being with us today and, and closing out, helping us close out today with this final Power Table Talk of the National Coalition of Black Civil Participation Signature Program, Black Women's Roundtable. Our leader, Melanie Campbell, would you like yes. to say a few words as we close out for the day? Our leader is, 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 is coming up. Just gonna say final close out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delisa. <laughs> Can we give our sister Dr. Delisa Saunders a round of applause? And actually, Tanya's going to close us out, our Vice President of Operations and Events Management, Ms. Tanya Tyson. Um, and I want to thank everyone who hung in here from 9 a.m., a lot of y'all, to now. And I think we're closing out on time, right at 2 o'clock. Um, and as she's coming up, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered again for live streaming this today and getting it out of this room. And I have a board member in the room, uh, our sister Tanya Lombard from AT&T, Vice President, uh, of, and uh, um, our sister Queen. Uh, if you want to have a good time, spend a little time. She let you in that circle band, and we had. A, and I'm, I'm just telling you, this sister does so much. She has something called Humanities of Connection. Um, she's a New Orleans girl, uh, born and reared, correct? So she's home, but I want her to know that we don't get a chance to get together much, but I, just getting together with you just for a few minutes last night, lifted by spirits. She does a lot, just as a sister. Yeah, she has the title, but as a sister, she's always thinking about what she can do to move the ball for our people. So I, I know she didn't want to say anything publicly today. Rolling, we all rolling, but love you, sister. And we thank you for all you do for our people. Tanya, turn it over to you. And thank you, ladies. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tanya Tyson, Vice President of Operations. And I want everyone to give all these wonderful, phenomenal women a round of applause for this excellent panel. And I want to thank everyone for attending and enjoy Essence Festival. Thank you. <laughs> One last thing, make sure you follow us, stay with us, follow Black Women's Roundtable, and then, and, uh, yeah, you're right. And donate, donate, donate. We gotta get in the streets and turn it out for 2022. Thank you. And thank you all, Wapo. That's it. Do a few interviews real quick. Okay, I'm trying to go over there. Um, probably, uh, I don't know, people probably gonna take pictures over there, so I'll probably just go somewhere. Huh? Can I get my little position for you for the next one? Okay. We may do a setup in this conference room.